Okay, so you guys good for me to start the lab? So, can I go here? so for the lab one, so I'm using tidy models for these lab exercises because I find I went through the base up, so it was a bit complicated that I feel like the solutions using the tiny models is more neat. So we're going to use the stock market data. So we have a few like uh, predictors or variables in it where the year, and this will be like the out lag one to lag five is just the percentage return for each of the trading days. Then you have volumes. Then what we want to do today is just predict the direction whether the market will go up or go down. So you have two outcomes, binary outcomes, up or down. So you want to see how the returns go. So for tidy models, they say you have to load all these library tidy words, tidy models. Uh, this cream is for the LDA and QDA, linear discriminant analysis and navies. And we also have this, how do I read this? Poison, poison regression. So if we look at the correlation using the pairs, just look at this data set, you can see this is not how I usually run correlation. So this is what given in the book. So I usually use this package called core CO and triple R core. So when you load this package and you run the correlations, I feel it's neater as in you can see some of the variables are correlated. Okay, so they don't really have a very strong correlations for all the variables. If we look at it in terms of data visualization, what we can see is the volume is highly more correlated to year, because the circles is bigger, and this seems to be the one of the stronger correlation. And the rest is like light gray means they are very big correlations. Okay. So this one, just how I mentioned the year and the volume correlation is higher. So it seems that they have about 0.54. The correlation is about 0.54. The rest is like less than, it's between 0, 1 to like whether positive or negative is between 0, 1 to like maybe higher will be like 0, 5 here. Yeah. So it's really big correlation. Seems that all these will be a very bad predictor for direction. Uh, hello. Mm. Hi, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, how, yeah, please. How do you manage to make the end is gray? <laughs> Which one? You mean the previous one or this current slide? Yeah, the, this is slide. How do you make the end is gray? I have no idea. I just copy and paste this one. If you like, I can send you this later <laughs> for you to explore with it. <laughs> okay. You can see like you like hit maps or something where you have like NAs in them. The, the, the code will sometimes will not run. <laughs> I think, right, it's because of this package. This uh, uh, palette R package. This is the one that, because I think I did not change the color, so it comes in the default color. Because I'm using this package, this library <laughs> thing. So this uh, is the one that okay. is causing the color to go like this. <laughs> so like, I, I don't really care about the color. So I was just trying to do out that thing, correlation. <laughs> hmm. This, the, the, I think you mean the diagonal, right? All the diagonal is great. Yeah, because most of the time when I try to do like heat maps, right? When there's a matrix, you always accept matrix, and when there's an NA, you can't put any colors in the. We can't. <laughs> yeah, we can't change. Yeah, I'm mean, like, not really yeah, cool with data. Because for the work that I do, I, I like they don't like colors, so everything is black, white, or gray. <laughs> so like this is the fanciest data visualization that I ever did. 
Okay, then if we look at exploring, if you just look at the volume, because volume and years in Sutta, you can see like the volume is actually not that strong. But if we just now we mentioned that the volume and the year, they are like more correlated, right? If you look at 2001 to 2005, it seems that there's an upward trend in terms of as the year increases, the volume seems slightly go up. It's not that obvious, but it seems 2005 that yeah, the volume seems to go up slightly. So, so we start with logistic regressions. So we want to aim is predict our direction using like one to like five the percentage of return the previous week five days and volume okay so what we did was you specify the model direction predicted by lab one to lab five and the volume the data is still this data and we specify the family as binomial because the direction is either up or go down so if you look at the summary this one seems to be all of these are uh, not significant definitely <laughs> because but uh, then the smallest p value that we can get is like one this is the smallest p value we get which is 0 0.145 and we get a negative correlation no the neg negative estimates for this so it suggests that okay so if the market was like positive return today you will most likely the market direction will go down so it was a negative direction so in tiny models so we have few things to do for logistic regression first you specify that you want to use a logistic regression and then you set the engine as glm then you set the mode as because we are running direction predicting uh, classification so we have to set the mode as classification okay then we have to specify model so in few steps is you specify the model this one is you put this here so first we set the engine then after that you fit the model as in still the same equation, um, still the same modeling, so direction predicted by lab one to lab five and volume, and we use the data. Then if you run it, you will get the coefficients here. So if you get the coefficient or this, you still get the same thing as the previous, how we do it in phase R. So there are more steps if you do it in tidy models. Okay, so the summary is still the same. And I like to use the tidy function as in it makes everything tidy up. So then you can see the p value is like neater and everything is like three or four decimal points. <laughs> so still the same, like one is like the smallest p value that you can ever get. It seems like here, like three to like five. Like the p-value is very high, most likely they are not a very good predictor for direction. So what you usually do after modeling, we always want to do the predict function. So you want to predict this, your model, then with a new data, so they will give you a run. This will run, if you use, do it this way, predict, it will predict up for all, all the rows that you have. Okay, then we can also do one if you specify the type, you can get the probability as in you see, like, so it's inverse as in if this is 0 0.493, this will be like 0 0.507. So these two add up should add up to 1.0, 1, 1 the probability. Then this is the most interesting part for classification for me, like the confusion metrics. So confusion metrics will tell us how well our model has actually performed and 
we will see how well we can get it through all the false red. So what you can do is use this function. Oh, sorry. Augment, then you run a confusion matrix, C-O-N-F and a T. Okay, so how we look at confusion matrix is, if you look here, this is the truth, right? Then this is our prediction. Okay, so what we want is when it's down, we want to predict down accurately. So you want this number here to be high. Then when it's up, you want it to be up as well. But it seems that up is performing quite well. It's quite good at predicting up, but not so good at predicting down. Because when it's down, down is only 145. It seems that when the market is down, they are more likely to predict it as up. Okay, so the model we can see is not really that good because the diagonal is not, the prediction is not high. So this is just a visual representation of the confusion matrix. So you want it to be here, 145 and 507, these two to be high. Then you can also look at accuracy. Instead of confusion matrix, you can calculate accuracy. Then we see that our model accuracy is only 0 0.52, so 52%. Slightly more than half, but not that great. And one other thing is, could be like we just fit a model, then we evaluated it on the same data. So the trick is we should try to split our data into two parts. One is the training data and one is the test data. This will be, I think, specified more in the next chapter five. <laughs> like how do we split the data? <laughs> so like, let's say we, let's try to split the data. So let's use the one that trading as the year before 2005, the 2001 to 2004 as the training data, and let's test it on the year of 2005, okay? So you still the same thing. You, let's say the fit is we still use the same spec. So this is the good thing about tiny models. So if you specify in parts, you can reuse it so you don't have to keep on typing it. So the spec, then you fit the direction, still the same. And then we can have the confusion matrix, still the same. You can see, let's say, this is on the testing, right? Data set. So up and up, when it's up and up, you predicted only 44. It seems that you predicted wrongly, 97. <laughs> then here is quite good. So it's quite good at predicting down but not so good at predicting up this time. So the accuracy is definitely because it seems that it got worse. Instead of like 552%, now it's about 48%. And they say this is expected because we are evaluating on the new data set. So, but anyway, the mod, it also means the model is not that great. So how we can improve predictability if we remove those useless predictors or not useless, insignificant predictors like most likely. So we only, let's say, we only use the sound like lag three to lag five. Those are not really awesome, not really helpful in predicting. Uh, so we use lag one, lag one and lag two, just these two variables. Okay, less variables we will expect our confusion metrics to like be better. As in, you see this time, when it's up and the truth is up, you get, and the prediction is up. Okay, so what, but the truth when it's down, it's not really still that great. So it seems that the model is still very bad at predicting down when it's really down. Okay, the accuracy, but the accuracy is slightly better. When you have less predictor, the accuracy is definitely better. So instead of 52, now we have about 56. It's like slightly performing better. <laughs> okay, um, 
then this is just one way. It's like they say, if you just put in the data, you can you have a very specific numbers that you want to predict using that model. You just put it in, then you should be able to predict. What is interesting is here, I feel that the probability, if you use the probability, you could see that um, here, predicting down and predicting up probability. Here, uh, I think this is down and it's more likely to predict down in the first situation, this one, one. Then this is higher chances also predicting down. So it means like the model is like not really that great still. It seems I, like they are the still all very close to 0 0.5. So it's yeah. kind of very <laughs> random, right? Like, when I was going through, like, I feel like why they don't use a better, like a, a good data set. It's like something with a better prediction. It's like there's no change. <laughs> Yeah, but this is what they use. <laughs> okay, so let's look at, we give our logistic regression, let's move on to LDA. <laughs> so if we use LDA, okay, so you have to use this, this cream underscore linear, then you set the mode as classification, and our engine now is MASS, M -A -S -S. so that's the package that you have to use. So our direction, let's, we don't use all five, we don't use all six predictors. Let's just use leg one and leg two because this seems two predictor. Then we use it on the training data set. Then we see how much our prediction improved. Yeah. So what we interesting is let's look at the group mean and we run it the group mean you can see there's a difference between the down and the up group. Okay, down you get all positive, up you get negative. Okay, so it seems that from here this negative, it seems that there's a tendency. So let's say the previous two days return to be negative, it means that the market most likely to increase. Then the predict one, just now we test it on the training data and we use predict to test it on the test one, data set. And you can see the probability, these are all the probabilities, but in terms of performance, let's look in terms of the confusion metrics. This time when it's up and up is 106, so it's true. But when it's down, it's still not good at predicting down. When the truth is like when it's down, you are more likely to predict it as up still. And the accuracy is about 56% also. So it's just the problem with the data set and the predictors are not really good at predicting the direction of the market. But uh, the accuracy, I feel like 56, it was the slightly lower than like 58, the logistic regression. I feel so LDA and logistic regression seems to perform quite similar, the accuracy, okay? So what if we move to quadratic? So quadratic, the specifications, the set mode. So the only thing changes is just this discrete quad instead of linear. Then classification and engine is still MASS. So everything else is the same. So this one, direction predicted by leg one and leg two, and it's still on the training one. Our confusion metric shows us that it's good at predicting up, really good, as in, you see now the force is a week, only 20. But it's still bad at predicting down, but I feel like it's less extreme now, like slightly less extreme, <laughs> the differences. And as if we check the accuracy, now you get up to about 60%. Okay, so this is an increase in accuracy. Although it's still kind of difficult to predict the down. So we can say it seems that quadratic seems to be the best model so far. 
that if we want to do naive base, right? You have to use whatever this library, K L A R, then naive base. You set the mode as classification. You set the engine K L A R. Then the most important is here you have to set the use kernel as false because they say you first assume, let's assume it's a Gaussian distribution means the normal distribution first. We're using the same model so that we can compare the accuracy and everything. So still the same model. And if we look at the confusion metrics, right? Now your prediction for the up one seems to get better and better. But it seems the model is improving in predicting when the market goes up, we really can predict. Um, so when the market goes down, you still cannot really get when it's down. So we still don't know when it's down when. So when it's down, most of the time, you always predict up still. Okay, so the accuracy seems to be, if you run the accuracy, I think I forgot to put the quotes here, but I remember the accuracy is quite similar to the QDA model. So it's about 60%, slightly less than the QDA, but slightly approaching 60%. So it seems naive base, naive base and the quadratic model perform similarly. Okay, so this is just the plot. If we run a plot between y, because we use these two predictors, black one and black two, and you can see from the scatter plot, there's definitely no relationship between the black one and black two. If you still remember the correlation matrix from the very earlier, earlier, earlier slides, that's almost like the correlations between black one and black two was almost less than 0 0.05. So it was like zero correlation. So we, when we use naive base, you definitely have to assume that the predictors are independently distributed. Okay, and the final one is we use the KNN. So KNN, so we set it, let's say we set it with neighbors, three, three neighbors. So fitting everything is done like earlier, where you just, this time we do nearest underscore neighbors, then we specify we have using three neighbors. Okay, then the engine is K, K, and F. So if you look at the training data or this, I'm not sure about K and N. So I think what we are interested in is this one, right? Minimum misclassification. But when I was looking, I was looking at this confusion matrix. So when looking at this confusion matrix, here, now here, when it's up, it's, it's still slightly better at predicting up, but here the number has increased up to 58. So there are differences, not a lot now. Then when it's down, it's still 43, but it's also quite similar to when it's down, you predicted up. Okay, so from this confusion matrix, because there are differences, not a lot, the true and the false one. So when we check the accuracy now, it's about 50%. So you just leave it to luck by chance. Either you get it right or you don't get it right. It's about 50%. This model is not really good. So they also talk, like in the tiny model book, they also talk about using this caravan insurance data set where they split the data. This is not how you're supposed to split the data. <laughs> but if we use this to test the KNN, right? So what they want to do is they want to look at the purchase and, and to see how, how you can predict the purchase. Let me think. Uh, was it? Uh, so the respond variable is purchased. So whether based on certain predictors or what they want to look is they look into the demographics. So what are 
what kind of individuals are more likely to purchase the insurance. So either you purchase it or not purchase it. In this data set, they have like about 6% people who purchase the insurance. So they want to look at what are the potential, who will be their potential customer in the future. So they want to do a modeling on that. So um, they mentioned one good thing is, I didn't know. Uh, so they say it's very important that your variables are centered. Okay, so because if we are using KNN model, they say it's very important that your variables are centered. You want to make sure all your variables have uniform influence. And you can do this using something called step normalize. It helps you to do centering, scaling in one function. So what you do is you do you set the recipe, like you want to predict a purchase using all the other variables inside the data, then you everything just step normalize. So you step normalize all numeric predictors. Obviously, we cannot normalize categorical predictors. So you step normalize all numeric predictors, then you do a workflow, the previous workflow, then you add recipe, so here is still the same. You, how you create the modeling is use nearest neighbor, then you set the model classification K and N. So this time, instead of neighbors adding it at the nearest neighbor here, we can do, let's say, one neighbors, three neighbors, or five. So K set as one, three, or five. So how you do it is when after you set the workflow here, you can do here workflow, then you add model. So the good thing about any models is let's say you want to change your model or do anything. You can set the template, then after that you add the model. Then you set the arguments here, neighbor one, neighbor three, or neighbor five. So K1, K3, K5. And when you use it to predict, so this is the first one. This is k equal to one. When k equal to one, it seems that it's very bad at predicting yes, because most of the time predict no, but it's really good at predicting no. So when people don't purchase it, it seems that the variable seems to be good at predicting when people not likely to purchase the insurance. But what is interest like what is important for the company is predict yes, like what really makes people want to purchase the insurance, not what makes people do not want to purchase the insurance. So this K1 is not that good. <laughs> the second one, if you look at K equals to 3 1, you still more likely to predict no. And you still cannot predict who is likely to purchase the insurance. Okay, that's the same for k equals to 5. So anyway, the model is not good. <laughs> okay, then the final one is they're using a byte share data. So what is interesting when this is Poisson regression, right? So they want to look at number of bytes per hour. So this is... We use these type of regressions when you have a variable, then your variable can take those like non-negative integer values. So we want to predict when are more people more likely to rent a bicycle. So how you do it is you set this, you specify what kind of regressions you're running, then you set the mode. The mode is still regression because it's under regression. Then the engine is PLM. Then you set the recipe as in, this is where you put your model in. So we want to predict like how many bikes they ran based on the month, hour, working day, temperature, and weather situation. Okay. Then I don't remember this step dummy thing. I have something to do with all nominal predictors. Ah, yeah. Oh, so step dummy, if I remember it correctly, was like 
you know, for those categorical predictors, you have to specify 0, 1, 2. I think this is the one for the contrast, where they do the contrasting. But I'm not sure. Please double check someone. Uh, then after that, you have to do set the workflow. You add the recipe, then you can add the model. So this is the spec, the model. This is our recipe. Then we fit the data and you can see how it looks like is this is the actual on the x-axis is the actual prediction and this is the prediction. So we want we're predicting the number of bikers per hour using the Poisson regression. And from here, you can see, if because month is one of the things that we look into it, it seems that, let's say, in February, March, April, it's a bit small, let's see. Yeah, February, March, April, May to December. So if you look at the coefficient, people are more likely, these are all positive, so people are is lower in the winter month. February, March, April, the coefficient is lower. People are more likely to rent a bicycle, obviously, because it's winter. <laughs> then from spring, but July slightly go down, but still quite high. From May to October, the co coefficient is quite high. So people are more likely to rent a bike in spring, summer, maybe autumn, then when it goes into no November, December, the winter one, the bike rental seems to go down slightly. Okay. So this one is looking at, oh, sorry, this is our variable, not month variable, yeah? So here the month is wrong. So, was it run? I think this one is the, the hour, but I think I put it wrongly. So we start, if assuming I start at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah. I didn't remember. Let me check a while. Mm, what is my equation? 8 plus 4 is 12, right? Plus 4 is 12. Oh. <laughs> Let me see. Oh. <laughs> So like oh, one, two, three, four. I need to check how I this one generate the one. Uh, this is the what Yeah, is I think the, the one is like twelve midnight. And it is your 8 a.m. Because they say that the peak occurs at 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So 5 p.m. Yeah. is 1,700 <laughs> hours, right? Yeah. yeah 1700. So 100, yeah. So 20, there are 100 hours. So 100 hours. So, yeah. Okay, so here's like, so it's 12. So it's 24 on the 24 scale, right? So it seems, so yeah, I think you are right. Here, here is yeah. 8. Then here is five. So could be people could be renting the bike to go to work from, from maybe like a metro station or something to go to the work. Then once they get off work, they rent the bike to get back to the metro station or something. So yeah, so the coefficient. So then in the nighttime, midnight, obviously people don't rent the bike here. Hmm. So this is how it looks like. I think that's all. <laughs> that's all I have. Oh my. You, you have any question? If we don't have questions, I think we can start on chapter five. Thank you, Megan. So I will share my screen. Okay, this okay. I mean, okay. So, can you see my screen? Yeah, 
this. Okay. okay. So, is, is there a way for us to, how do I say, collapse the left header? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to do that, but I was just going between the subsections. So, that's why I was using that before. So, we will start chapter five. Uh, it's about resampling methods, and here is our um, outline. So we will talk about validation set and then leave one out cross validation and k, k fold cross validation and the bootstrap and advantages and disadvantages of those according to outline of our shared notes. And for our chapter five, I might prefer to follow on the book. By the way, the size of the text is okay for you? Okay, then. Um, then, yeah, so for resampling methods, normally we have a, a training set and the test set, but let's assume that uh, before uh, testing our set, we want to check the success of our uh, model just by using the training set. Um, so that's why, um, I mean, I just started there. I don't know. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, maybe I might need to tell about this. Um, okay. We might need to evaluate our model's performance. And if uh, we are evaluating our model's performance, it is called as model assessment. And if we are working on the level of flexibility, this uh, process is called as model selection. So this. I suppose I'm not very close to this model assessment and model selection part because uh, it is just, these terms are just used in this part of the chapter, but it might be very useful later, I don't know. So let's continue. Uh, then I was telling that um, we normally have a, a training set and a test set. Uh, and we also have a test error rate and training error rate. So by using uh, these error rates, we can have an idea uh, about the, maybe we can call it maybe success rate of our model. Uh, but before testing it, we might need to uh, check um, like the success or um, error rate of our model. So that's why we might need the validation set. And um, so I might give an example, like uh, in Turkey right now, there is a contest called as Technofest and they use artificial intelligence in too many areas. I don't know if it is, if it is uh, so professional or not, but uh, this is just, uh, made me thought that yeah on there will be a day of contest and they will give uh, the people a test set and they will just test the method test the model there so that's actually why people need a validation set before the day of contest so that was how I was thinking about the valid, the, like the importance of validation set. So, um, what, what normally we have only a training set, so we separate it into two parts as training set and validation set, or uh, it's also called as holdout set. So, we just uh, excluding a part of the data, and then we will use that to check um, whether the model works good or not. Uh, so then 
um, we fit the model according to our training set. And according to that, we uh, predict the responses uh, for the validation set. And um, this way, we can also estimate the test error rate. So before the, uh, let's say, before the day of contest, we can estimate the error like days before or months before, I don't know. So uh, maybe I can also move forward here as well. Um, so, okay. Here we see the um, example of how the validation set approach works. Uh, normally we have a data and we can say that there are uh, an observations uh, starting from one to three, but we separate them into two equal parts, but uh, the data is randomly split. Uh, so we can have half of the data for um, training and the other half of the data for uh, validation and here we might have uh, some problems as well uh, because uh, okay it's actually very simple and yeah easy to understand just we like we shuffle the data and we split it into half and use half of it for training and the other half of it uh, for validation. Um, however, uh, the validation error rate is so um, not stable, I can say, because we cannot show, we cannot know that uh, when we shuffle the data, uh, it might be biased. So it might uh, contain uh some of the data in the training i mean let's say that uh, the data goes from one two three to n and we shuffle them and we split it in the half however there is a there's still a possibility that let's say the lower half stays in the training and the upper half remains in the validation so when the model um sees the validation data it might uh, feel like, okay, I have never seen these things. So uh, it can tell us that, okay, I don't know, maybe. I mean, it will not tell us that, but it will not give us uh, correct predictions. And that this will cause the like higher validation error rate. And um, this may, uh, this way, um, we can also not uh, say that um, okay we can have a problem that um, i got confused a little bit because i am not good at for, I am following on both sides. I'm sorry about that. Um, then, yeah, I suppose I will tell that here. So the, there's a possibility that validation error rate will tend to overestimate the error rate. Actually, it's not a, it's not totally a, possibility it is like i suppose how it is and here we have the second figure and here we have the auto data and uh, we have the mean squared errors on y axis and degree of polynomial on the uh, x axis and we can say that uh, if we have a second degree of uh, polynomial or second degree of model, let's say, uh, 
our mean squared error decreases uh, significantly. And if we try to use uh, higher degrees of uh, the model, it will be more complex. However, it will not bring us uh, it will not bring us better results. Uh, so it will just give us a heavy computational um, burden. And here we see uh, 10, I suppose it was 10. Yes, 10 times of um, uh, like validation set. So we uh, let's assume that we shuffle our data and we split it in half and we worked our model on that. And we did this process 10 times. So for all of them, we see uh, the mean squared error change. And it, it uh, actually it shows that uh, the high possibility of uh, correct distribution of data, not correct, but uh, equal distribution of data uh, is not possible and it uh, results a uh, bias, bias. But here we see that also um, for all 10 um, validation set, we have, uh, I mean, for all other complex models, we can say that um, a second degree of model or quadratic degree of model uh, decreases mean squared error and the others, like the other levels of complexity, um, it might change like uh, mean squared error might increase or decrease and it goes like that. The only thing we can see here is that um, second degree of a polynomial would work on uh, these models the, for these data, data sets. Uh, however, their uh, error rates are, um, how to say, changing, like variable, yeah. Uh, so we can say that due to the um, not sufficient di distribution of the data into validation set and training set, uh, test error rate can be, I mean, estimated test error rate can be highly variable, as we can see here. Uh, and Um, and yeah, the validation set uh, error rate may tend to overestimate the test error rate. Um, so I tried to explain it, but uh, I get, I can get a little bit confused during, I mean, both explaining and presenting. I'm sorry for my, um, maybe nervousness, I'm sorry. No, uh, but I find, yeah. I find before like reading this chapter, I find interesting just, I don't know, I'm in the psychology field, right? So we always thought that we always use this random assignment. And when I look at the MPG data set, we have about like 234. So I thought that when we split it equally half-half, we would get about the same MSC error rate. But it seems that from this right figure here, the MSC error rate varies a lot because they split yes. it 10 times. And for me, like 200 plus is a very huge data set. And assume when you split it 10 times, your MSC wouldn't change that much. Although they didn't change that much too, to be honest. It's like 16 up to like 26. So it's like yes. roughly the 10. <laughs> yeah. But like 
the the graph like the data visualization just make it like super obvious they are like very different MSC. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah like does. I assume like yeah. they randomly put into two groups, it will be about the same on the value. I never thought of this one before this. Chapter. Yeah, it's a good idea, but it's not enough. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, so I was just wondering like how big the data set has to be in order for us to use this random assignment <laughs> into yeah. two data sets. Mm. I think yeah, it's but quite difficult because it also depends on the size of each group like for your insurance data that canvas that you showed like why is it so good in predicting no is because the no data set was so much bigger than the yes data set and if you want to ah. do that validation on this kind of things you have a very high chance that your training set will just contain all your yeses and then you have a model that just only says yes regardless of what kind yes. of data it is yeah because in that data set, only 6% of people actually bought the instrument. It means about 94% people did not buy the insurance. So that's why I think that's a very valid point. Why it's so good at predicting no <laughs> rather than yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you apply the validation step in that kind of data, <laughs> the variation probably be a... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why I say it's a very bad data set to do the yeah, validation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the computer yes. metrics is like really bad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nile, are you okay with like going on or do you want to go like do you want to do the leave one out validation next week? Yeah, and I suppose we can the, continue okay. next week. Okay. Because yeah. I mean, if it is okay for you, we can do it on yeah, the next. Yeah, we always we are like running out of time as well. <laughs> yeah. So it'll okay, be okay. best if you like can start on this sub section next week. I think okay. this one and the other one, I think was a K one leaf out of that one. Yeah, yes, that's yes, the yes. one the more important. <laughs> yes, and then bootstrap will come. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, this K is nice. So let's just end here today, then we shall continue next week. Okay. Um, um, if you, you, if you, do you plan to do the lab next week and the theoretical part? Yeah, I suppose I can do that. I mean, um, I suppose I need to work on presenting because mm -hmm. I get, so I don't know how to say. No, was <laughs> I'm not good at explaining, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I, I need to work on that. But uh, I suppose I can do that. I will yeah. uh, work on tidy models as well. Yeah. Uh, if it's too you much, you can just do the base R, the one in the book. It doesn't have to be tidy mm -hmm. models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's see. I mean, I will try my best. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Okay, let's end here. Then. I'll see you guys all next week. <laughs> see you. Bye. Have a nice week. Bye. You too. <laughs> <laughs>